The company Wix migrated from a request reply RPC style system to an asynchronous event driven architecture. Not surprisingly, they ran into a few issues. Thankfully, one of their developers wrote a blog post outlining five of the pitfalls. I'm going to shed a little bit more light on some of the problems and solutions that they had outlined in this blog post because they're all pretty common, but hopefully they give you a little bit more insights so you don't make the same mistakes. Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design, just like this one talking about event-driven architecture. So make sure to subscribe. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So here's the blog post in question. I'll have a link in the description, and this is from Wix developer, Nathan Silnitsky, if I'm saying that correctly. So I think this blog post is really important because it's outlining kind of the learning curve and things that they learn in migrating apparently a microservices architecture of 2300 currently from a request reply pattern, and I'm assuming they mean RPC there, uh, and then they're going to an event-driven architecture. So the things that they're pointing out here, I have blog posts and videos on all of these. So they're actually fairly common, but I think they're important to point out here and give me a little bit more commentary on this because some of the names, uh, there's actually patterns for some of the names that they're doing and there's alternative solutions than what they outlined. So here are the five, here are my thoughts. So the first pitfall that they mentioned is just really reliably publishing events when you make a state change. So you make a state change to, to your database, but then you need to publish an event. Well, because you don't have a distributed transaction, and in their case, they're talking about say MySQL and Kafka, if you make a state change to MySQL, but what happens when you fail to publish to Kafka? So their solutions to this, they have two. Their first is that they have their own messaging platform called Greyhound, which ultimately what I believe it does based on kind of this diagram is that if it fails to publish to Kafka, then it will publish uh, and serialize that message and store it in S3, which then ultimately will go from S3 to back to Kafka. So they do mention they kind of had of out of order processing issues with this. And that makes sense because they're likely when it goes to S3, it's kind of delayed to getting to Kafka. Their second alternative is, I believe you call this DBZM, and it's a Kafka source connector that basically looks at the MySQL bin log and is basically doing CDC change data capture. And it's creating those events, kind of just change events, and it's pushing those to Kafka. But there's a third option that I've mentioned in several different videos, which is a transactional outbox or the outbox pattern. So when we were trying to make our state change and then send a message to our broker and that's failing, what the outbox pattern allows us to do is persist both our state change and a message we want to serialize as a one atomic commit to our primary database. So when we make our state change, we're also going to serialize and send our event, our message to our primary database, a part of that same transaction. So this could be serialized as an object to some collection or something as a row in a database. So once that's done, we've persisted the event that we want to publish. Now a part of a different thread, it could be a different process. You're going to have something that's going to be fetching that data from our database and deserializing that message, that event, creating that message, and then sending it to our broker. So this is really the third option is the outbox pattern. Now you might be thinking that CDC and something like DBZM is the same as an outbox. And it can seem that way, but it is different because your outbox is still explicitly capturing the events that you want to publish, not just change events. So it's not that the, a product was changed and the quantity is different. Why is the quantity different? If you're using an outbox and you're publishing a very specific event, such as there's an inventory adjustment, well, there's an inventory adjustment. That is why the, the quantity changed. So it's about being explicit versus having to infer and just really ha look be looking at kind of an entire entity or data that changed, but not really knowing why. Now you could be using something like DBZM and actually persisting, serializing your event to your primary database and having it, DBZM, be the one that's actually publishing the event like an outbox. So yes, but just make the distinction that if you're just using kind of off of the data and entities and tables that you're doing and kind of more of that traditional product change or this changed event, it's very different from being explicit about the event that you want to publish. So the second pitfall they mentioned is using event sourcing everywhere. But I don't necessarily know that they mean event sourcing everywhere. Or again, if like a lot of people do, if they're conflating event sourcing as a way to persist state 
and capture state changes or as a way to communicate with other service boundaries. And I get the, I get the sense they're kind of conflating the two here. But yes, but it is very true that you don't necessarily need to be doing events sourcing everywhere if you're just trying to use events as a means to communicate with other service boundaries. Again, event sourcing is about how you persist state um, and how you do event-driven architecture in terms of communication are two different things. So they kind of mention here how you have all these different events that you're persisting for your to your event store, but you're also publishing them to a broker so that you can communicate with other service boundaries. So they mentioned kind of the disadvantages here that they found complexity in doing snapshots. I mentioned in videos prior about how snapshots really are a pre-optimization. You really only need to go there. I would really first be looking at kind of your event streams themselves, kind of their lifetime, how long they're actually living. Like, do you, are you really capturing the events that you should be um, before you even go to the idea of uh, snapshots? Um, and then they're talking about eventual consistency, the typical things we kind of hear about uh, um, event sourcing. So what their alternative here is to do CRUD in CDC. Now, this is kind of alluding to what I just mentioned where they're mentioning how, okay, they're doing CRUD, but then what they're doing is using CDC to publish those events. However, what they're seeing, which makes sense, is that they probably ran into, is that now you have CDC and if you're exposing those events to other service boundaries, well, now they kind of really have an insight into your database structure, which you don't want to leak out. So rather what they're doing is have something within that service boundary that is subscribing to those CDC changes and then changing those, mutating those into a different events that you're publishing to the outside world. Now, the thing here is that just like I mentioned earlier, is that if you're doing this, you're losing intent. You're not going to be, you're going to have to infer from the CDC events what actually happened. So likely what you're going to be doing is getting some CDC event and turning it into just some integration event that really is just a something changed event, but not really that involves what, what business action actually occurred. You're going to have to start inferring that. And that's a really big distinction. So if you're using CDC and trying to transform those events into something else, you would still end up in this kind of these cruddy events is what I call them, like product created or product updated, product deleted, or more property based, the product quantity updated or product price changed. And these are very different and they don't really have any idea of what actually happened. When you're talking about event sourcing and talking about persisting them as, as a means of events as state, it's what actually happened what business action occurred that resulted in something of an inventory adjusted or a price increase. Now, just because you're using event sourcing and recording this as state does not necessarily mean, or should you be publishing these events for other services to consume? There's a distinction there. The third pitfall that they mention, I really think they're talking about kind of visualizing workflow and causation and correlation between events. So you have, you're consuming events, you're producing more events, and there's a start and kind of an end to that, but you want to be able to see how everything actually occurred in a workflow. And I agree, this could be really difficult, especially years ago, but now it's become much simpler with things like open telemetry and visualization of that data and something like Zipkin. I'll have a link in the description for a video that I've done on those two that illustrate this. And it really becomes painless now to kind of really see an entire workflow. So this has become simpler. So the fourth pitfall that they mention are large messages. And this makes sense is that you have a large payload and you don't necessarily want to put it in the message in the event. So there are kind of two remedies here is that they mention with Kafka is compression. The second me uh, method that they mention is kind of chunking is splitting up your messages. But there's actually a third alternative that they do mention here as well, which is reference to an object store, meaning basically create your message, put some reference into it, where the object is actually stored. And this is actually called the claim check pattern. So with the claim check pattern, you're just sending that large amount of data that you have to say some blob storage. And like I said, you just simply reference that in the message. So that way when your consumer picks up and consumes that message, it knows where to go get that, that actual data and it can go fetch it. Now, obviously here, producer and consumer need to have access to that shared resource of blob storage so that you do have that concern. Um, that you have the same right authorization to be able to go get that blob storage. But this is just a way to offload that data so that you're not actually putting it into your messages. Now, the last kind of pitfall that they mention here are how you want to deal with duplicate events because it will happen, especially if in various scenarios, but one of them as well is when I was talking about the outbox. So you got to handle processing an event or a message more than once. 
Their illustration of how this is a problem is they are producing a payment completed event, and then you have some inventory service that's consuming that to reduce the inventory, the, the quantity on hand. And if it processes that event more than twice or more than once, it's actually going to reduce the inventory twice or three times or however many times it processes it, and then the quantity on hand is going to be incorrect. So their kind of solution to this is to have some type of um, versioning, some type of a revision ID on the actual event that is kind of indicated of the the entity that you're dealing with. And this is a little bit weird for me because I generally try to stay away, and I've done videos on this, on thinking about entities and entity services and having things focused on that, but rather around workflow. And I would much prefer be thinking about workflow and events as notification for workflow. So in that case, you're really not thinking about kind of a entity ID or some type of revision ID, but more you're gonna use in the same type of means as what they're talking about for dealing with duplicate events is you're gonna be putting some type of unique message ID that you can use to make your handlers or consumers item potent. But again, it's really thinking about item potency and how you wanna handle that you are gonna likely handle uh, and try to consume the same message more than once. Now I have no inside knowledge about Wix or how any of this works. I just found this blog post to be interesting and probably helpful for people to know kind of the pitfalls that you can run into if you're migrating from RPC to an event-driven architecture. The thing I'm kind of hesitant in all of this is that there's so much reference to CDC and how they're using it in terms of reliably publishing events, how they were talking about the end there about entities and CDC for um, dealing with duplicate processing. And I, I can kind of sense that the idea here is if you have a system that's really driven around entities and that you're trying to move to an adventure of an architecture, you're still going to be in this entity service world. You're just now doing it with events. And that can be very different than being very explicit about the events in terms of workflow and how stuff's occurring in your system. So it's again, it's not about a product change, but it's more so about the quantity on hand was changed because there was a inventory adjustment inventory adjusted that's the event or there's just different things that will happen in your system rather than just state changes and you want to know why they occurred these events won't really have much in terms of entity data they'll really just generally have ids and it's because you're using them to kind of execute workflows long-running business processes and when you kind of get into what i feel like is more in the cdc world that they're talking about here you're really just doing data propagation and you start storing uh, data from other services in your own service. And it's more kind of like event carried state transfer. I've created videos, multiple videos on all of these topics. So make sure to check them out and make sure to subscribe. Thanks to my developer level members on YouTube and Patreon. They get access to a private Discord server where you can talk about these ideas with other developers. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. I try to reply to all of them. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.